inspire people to pursue a passion for paddling, for health, enjoyment, friendship, challenge and achievement. That's what British Canoeing states as their purpose. Their vision, a united British canoeing focused on our people and ambitions and excellent in delivery. Now it's clearly an ambitious aim and a wide ranging remit and on this episode of Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, we've come to find out how they do it. I'm John. And I'm Michael, and British Canoeing has 11 stated ambitions as part of their overall strategy. They cover everything from increasing participation in paddle sport to improving pathways to international success. Medals, in other words, at European, World, Olympic and Paralympic level. And we're at the National Water Sports Centre in Nottingham to meet the man at the helm of an organisation that originally dates back to 1936. I'm David Joy, the Chief Executive for British Canoeing. So, David, first of all, tell us how wide-ranging a remit that you've got, because people will know about para canoe, which made their debut in 2016. They'll know about sprint and slalom canoe at the Olympics, been there since the 30s. A lot more goes on in this building, though, isn't there? Absolutely. The the Olympic and Paralympic disciplines are are really important to the sport, but 80% of our members don't even compete. So we're definitely a sport, but, but also a lifestyle, a leisure pursuit. And, and for thousands and thousands of paddlers, getting out onto the water, onto the lakes, onto the sea, to enjoy that as a recreation is, is a very important part of what we do and supporting them to do that is 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 crucial business for us. But but in, in competition-wise, as well as the Olympic and Paralympic disciplines, we've also got seven or eight non-Olympic disciplines. Last year, we won uh, just, just short of 100 medals in European and World Championships across the non-Olympic disciplines, canoe polo, marathon, freestyle, uh, surf and, and and the list goes on, um, and and those people just as committed as as the Olympic and Paralympic athletes to to being the best they can be. How important has it been then for you to introduce what you've called here at British Canoeing your Vision Twenty Twenty to encompass all of that? It's been crucial and and fascinating at, at the same time. So I arrived in in two thousand sixteen, and we began a. A consultation pretty quickly about what people wanted British canoeing to be and one of the top five uh, things that came back in the, the first survey is that British canoeing can't have a single vision it can't be a single join up organization be- because to that point it had never been and and the the recreational paddler just didn't connect with the with the with the vision of the Olympics and 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 felt that the governing body was only focused on Olympic and Paralympic sport. So, so we would we were sure we wanted to build an organisation that was all encompassing, and and set off on that journey. And and the first the first stage of that really was listening really hard to 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 lots of different groups and individuals. What what do people want this organisation to be? And uh, when we 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 did a, an online survey to begin with in in the April. And and six themes came through loud and clear: uh, competition and coaching and, and recreation. And we got on the road and and through the rest of 2016 talked to a lot more people. And in the end, we couldn't we couldn't cut it down to more than the 11 ambitions that we've got. And people people tell me for an organisation to have 11 ambitions is ridiculous and it should be fewer. But actually, it, it does demonstrate the breadth of our organisation. And each one of those is still really important and, and we're just now looking towards 2125 strategy and I, I don't see it any differently actually and and the consultation we're getting back from members they they don't see it any difficult differently that defines the breadth of who we are and we need to do the whole lot really well so you said you did lots of listening because some groups can be quite vocal and whitewater rafting for example is nothing to do with canoeing or paddling or sprint canoe or slalom how as a chief exec do you manage the kind of vocal side of it and and deal with that i think the 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 first point i think is recognizing that everything is important and and again people might say well you, you can't say everything's important you just otherwise you end up doing nothing but but we're a, we're a wide organisation, and and so we did we did listen really hard, and there was a there was a really strong sense that that coaching needed to change. So our qualifications and the way that we engage with coaches and help coaches get better that's a big population for us, twelve thousand coaches, uh, and they were largely dissatisfied. 
So we spoke at depth. What what did what improvements did they want to see? They wanted the qualifications changing. They wanted online learning. They didn't want to pay so much for the courses. Uh, they wanted the courses simplified. And that that in its in its little self is a really good example of what we did because within the four years we will have reviewed all of the courses. We will have made them simpler. It, people can go straight into assessment if they're suitably competent. And and up until this point, we've had forty six thousand coach engagements with our e-learning platform, which wasn't even in place in 2016. And so for rafting to come back to the question, it's the same story really. It's an important part of what they what it's an important part of what we do. So what do they want to do? Where do they want to be? How do we help them to get there? And for every little part of our organization we've we've done exactly the same. And right now we're we're enjoying some fruits of that labour and and satisfaction levels coming really strongly in, in, in the positive. I was going to say to coin a, a water phrase: Are you in calm waters now, British canoeing, compared to where you were, rather than the the choppy waters? Certainly calmer, and uh, my my inbox compared to what I had in sixteen is is very different. I think satisfaction levels tell a lot. Actually, we 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 survey a lot, so we've got. 11 ambitions we've got 20 kpis around those ambitions and and four or five of those around satisfaction levels so member satisfaction level now has gone up to 75 percent of our members being satisfied or very satisfied with british canoeing and net promoter score has gone from minus nine to minus four to plus 23 now those things aren't those things don't come easily that that is because we list, we have listened and we've changed and started to to deliver what what people want so it's it's a governing body of sport at the end of the day we we are there to work with our volunteers volunteers incredibly passionate about their little bit so there are still things we're working on but largely in a good place right now is the brand the name british canoeing a bit of a misnomer because you have such a, a wider remit do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah, ex- it, 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 I understand entirely. And uh, we rebranded, I think, just before I arrived from British Canoe Uni. Most people still refer to us as BCU, to British Canoeing. And in the last couple of years, lots of our members have suggested it's it's time to change the name again. I look at Australia, I've just gone to Paddle Australia. Uh, that probably... Um, reflects more what we do as well, that we're a paddle sport, we embrace rafting, we embrace stand-up paddle boarding, as well as canoeing and kayaking. Um, so at some point, we'll we'll do that piece of work properly, but, but when we do it, we'll want to do it properly, and it's about freeing up the time and the resource to do it properly. Uh, and it feels as if it's not critical now, uh, but we'll come back to it for sure in the in the near future. One of the things I'm really intrigued about, and I guess you know the, the man or woman on the street is intrigued about, is... Why does a sports governing body need such a detailed strategy? What does it offer you? Why go away and do that piece of work? Most governing body strategies are not as detailed as Stronger Together. Um, that approach is something that I bring to an organisation and was really clear at recruitment stage. That's that's what I would be bringing. And I think it's the 11 ambitions were... Um, as I said before, hard to get away from. Um, most most organisations like ours are going to increase participation, increase membership, develop clubs, develop coaches. Uh, we, we'd also got the strong access agenda, creating a real unequivocal right to paddle on inland waterways and an environment agenda that, that other governing bodies don't have. So that's why we ended up with the 11, and it would have been really easy to stop at that point. And we're going to do these 11 things and we're going to put some big numbers, uh, KPIs there. But actually, it's it's about the how. What are you going to do and how are you going to bring about this change? And and I prefer and our board prefers that we say really clearly what we're going to do by 21 and then report progress against it. So if, if I use the coaching example, uh, well, let me use another one. Let me use membership as an example. Uh, we needed to review our membership categories. We needed to change the the platform on which we were building. And we needed to improve the communication to members and the and the benefits to members. And so we said that's exactly what we're going to do. And we put a date, either 17, 18, 19, 20, when it be done. And now we're making really good progress. At this point, uh, with a year to go, we're, we're 35 out of our 67 targets completed. And by the time we get to the end of next year, I would expect us to be north of 50 of those. The organisation will be in a very different place as a result. So I don't have any fear at all 
on behalf of our volunteers and our members and our staff saying, we're going to do this and then get on and do it and show that we've done it and, and feel the benefits as a result. And that aim is for 75,000 uh, new members by 2021. So what would give you most satisfaction then? Is it hitting that kind of target or coming back from Tokyo with a heap of Paralympic and Olympic gold medals? They, they're equally important. And as I said before, the 11 ambitions are all drivers for parts of our organisation. So being successful in all 11 is really key. Uh, the two that you've just given me bring very different things. Um, membership income is a key part of the sustainability of this organisation. It also shows us, when members want to join us, it shows us that we're doing the right things. So we now we, we had um, five years of decline in membership before 2016. From 2016 onwards, we've had annual growth in membership. We're now at 40,000 members. The big jump will come when the 25,000 members of clubs who are still not members of British Canoeing come into membership. And, and, that, and that's hearts and minds, and we're in that process right now. So membership growth shows the health of the organisation. It's critical, but it also brings us revenue that we can then invest back into. So the, the, each and every one's important. Of course, we want to see uh, membership grow, but we equally want to see uh, the athletes being successful, fil fulfilling their dreams in, in Tokyo. We'll come back to Tokyo uh, a bit later on, but I want to talk a little bit about you. You came into British canoeing without any canoeing background if you like. Do you, th do you think that was actually beneficial? A little bit of background in so much as I'd paddled twice in the scouts. So, and uh, I think I'd done a pool course uh, as a result of that I, because I liked it. But I, I was appointed because of my 30 years experience in sports organisations. And when I look across the landscape of, of CEOs in governing bodies now, more often than not, CEOs are appointed from not within the sport. Uh, so... I, th I think as a CEO, it, it's it's more important that I'm able to manage the process of strategy, manage the process of change, uh, and help the organisation get where it needs to go, rather than having a strong background in in paddle sport. There'll be there'll be many members who 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 probably think the CEO should have that background in paddle sport, and and one day somebody might combine the two. But I don't feel that it's held me back at all, and I, and I think the key is that you properly listen if whether you whether you're from the sport or not actually listening is really key having empathy uh, around the culture and understanding pretty quickly the culture of an organization is key and then it's you you you're successful based on, on what you bring because we talked about earlier about vocal groups and there was quite a lot of comments when you joined about you not having that background but how did that make you feel i I, I would expect that really, and do you, do you understand? It, yeah, hundred 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 percent. And the the former chief executive, previous chief executive, did was from the sport and had a background and still still involved in the sport. So understand it and would expect it. Uh, and and my attitude coming in was that if if we were able to move in a way that I, I was pretty sure we would, that over a period of time and hopefully relatively quickly people would begin to trust me, the executive team and the board by what we've done and what we're doing here right now today, the next day, as opposed to what we might have done um, prior to coming into the role. So, so, and I, and I think we're there. Um, there will be still some people who, who, who are uncomfortable. I think largely now we're moving in a very positive direction and people see British canoeing as better and stronger. Uh, and by association, the leadership provided by me and the executive team and the board, I think, is seen as a positive rather than a negative. Because I know it's not the most scientific of research, but I went away when I knew we were meeting today and put your name into various paddling forums about when you were appointed. And lots of people are going, what's this man from Scottish Athletics and England Golf? What can he bring to our sport? That's pretty nonsensical, isn't it? Because there's plenty of transferable skills in terms of leadership of an organization yeah I, I did the same before i was appointed and read the the same comments and as i say i i, I would expect it but the, i've been chief executive now of three three governing bodies this, and you've this, this taken the people third. with you yeah I, I look back on each one with with some pride and uh, the journey's been similar actually so scottish athletics an absolute transformation top to bottom and we did some collectively we did some really positive things in athletics and it's it's continued to grow uh, since my time with with 
with Scottish athletics and and some some fantastic athletes coming out. But but again, in terms of legacy, a program called Jog Scotland that didn't exist. We 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 created it to engage the recreational runner. Uh, it's now got twenty thousand members, which is which is a lot larger than the Scottish athletics body itself. The same at England Golf. Again, a transformation program. It had never had a strategy before. It was working. In a, uh, we were working in a very complex environment. The organisation needed governance change. We created some of that. Not not as far as I would have liked it to have gone, um, but but definitely. And then the same here. Actually, the the same challenges were presenting. So having done that twice in other governing bodies and and once more in a, a county sport partnership, um, I could very quickly see what needed to be done, and therefore. We've been able to move relatively quickly, actually, to bring about the change required. Let's talk about some of your campaigns, some of your ambitions. One of those is to increase mass participation paddle events. And there's this aim for three national paddle events. Do you need, in a way, the paddle equivalent of Ride London or a Great North Run or the Leeds Triathlon? Is that something that you can create here, perhaps? Yeah, that was a that was a target that we, we put into the plan and we've not we've not yet really delivered on but it, but exactly that i think um most most people paddle in 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 small groups and and uh, and the most of the bigger events are competitive events so creating mass paddles is is an obvious gap within our sport and something that could be on television for four or five hours on a sunday afternoon in the same way that you know those events I just mentioned are. Yeah, and and in other countries we we see that there's a huge event in in Paris. Uh, there was an event that we were closely associated with on the the Thames last year that was cancelled at the last minute. Regatta London, and so so we think those are those are big opportunities for us to pursue. And and early indications are, are that the members and paddlers will would love to get involved in in big events. And you'll be pleased to know that. We're very aware of a huge campaign, which is Clear Access, Clear Waters website launched um, for that. But what actually is it? Tell us a bit about it. A number of threads to it, but the absolute driver is is to bring some clarity to legislation. So 96% of the, the rivers, inland waterways in England, access to paddle on them is, is contested. So 4%, which tend to be the, the, the bigger rivers, are licensed uh, and Paddlers get licenses through membership. They can paddle on them rivers like the, the Trent and the Thames and the Severn. Um, the rest of the waterways, when when paddlers go on those waterways, quite often just being on the water will be contested by um, other water users or land landowners. And we don't think that's right. And we we passionately believe that the law needs to be clearer. It's not the case in the rest of Europe. It's not the case in Scotland. It's almost uniquely the case in England and Wales. And at a time when uh, it's never been more important that the public are, are active, uh, there's never been more people wanting to be active in the outdoors. We think it's completely anomalous that there is lack of clarity in the law. So we've been working really hard with MPs, with ministers, uh, with the civil servants, and gaining real traction, we launched our charter just over 14, 15 months ago. And we believe that this change in legislation will come. It's for us now to keep working over the next two or three years to bring it about. This is anything but footy. Great British bosses. We're talking to David Joy, uh, CEO of British Canoeing. We're talking paddling. That's the uh, the key word that we, uh, we need to keep mentioning. Um, your event strategy is about bringing major events to the UK as well, along with alongside UK Sport. How beneficial is that as for an organisation or for your sport and, and legacy terms? Hugely. We <clears throat> we think that hosting events is a an important part of fulfilling our responsibility with the international federations. We're, we're a big international federation. Someone has to host events. We need to take our turn. That That is for sure. Uh, but but we we see enormous benefit from the events that we host. So last year we hosted Slalom World Cup at Lee Valley and, and we've got the European Championships in, in May and then a Freestyle World Cup later this summer and Freestyle World Championships next year. And and just from just talking about the event that we hosted last year, 220 volunteers gave four or five days to volunteer on the event and many of those are coming into the, the Freestyle uh, World Championships so, so people new to volunteering, getting involved in our sport, re- really helping. The athletes performed phenomenally well at that event. And, and home advantage and the chance to compete in front of parents and friends and family uh, and, for our, and for our members to be able to shout and cheer is, again, all part of building the community that we're trying to build in, in British canoeing. 
it's it's also really critically from a, a commercial point of view, and we were able to attract event sponsors uh, for the first time. We we've we our commercial strategy is less developed than I would like to see it, but some fantastic sponsors in 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 Jaffa and Red Bull and and others that that actually are working with us now outside of the events, which which is all all very encouraging. So we see it as a, an essential part of who we are and what we do. And we'll continue to do that for the foreseeable future. Just very quickly on legacy, because I spent my whole 2012 covering the Olympics and every week it was, well, what's the legacy? What's the legacy? When you look back now at Lee Valley and where we are in in Nottingham and we still have the National Sports Centre here in Nottingham, there is that legacy that people were worried about, isn't there? Lee Valley is arguably the best example of of olympic legacy anywhere i would suggest the the, the center itself commercially viable um, very diverse sources of income actually uh, we are regular users of the site our athletes are there all day every day the development programs that have gone into schools have produced now junior international athletes um, people that weren't even paddling in 2012 now in our junior international teams beth foro being the the best example and so, uh, absolutely, I, I think it has to be thought through from the outset. If, you, if you're serious about legacy, you need to build it into design, you need to build it into structure, and then it doesn't happen on its own. You need really great management in the centre of working with the, with the governing body. But we believe in it passionately, and uh, we'd, like to see, we'd like to see further developments. Since we recorded this interview with David, British Canoeing and UK Sport have published the recommendations from an independent investigation set up following serious allegations about a coach. The report found a culture of fear within the organisation, particularly within sport, but said judged purely on its ability to win medals, British canoeing was deemed a success, but that came at a heavy price, namely the physical and emotional welfare of many athletes. UK Sport welcomed the report and says it recognises that British canoeing has made significant progress. British Canoeing has unreservedly apologised. I think athlete welfare, um, we were not in the place we should have been coming out of Rio and had a good hard look at that through 2016 actually before before we went into Rio and by by the end of Rio, uh, by the end of the games in Rio we're already making changes and that we want athletes to be successful but, but we also need the athlete voice to be heard and I'm not sure as it was in British canoeing at that time. So we made some fundamental changes in, in terms of our, we created a governance team, we appointed an athlete welfare coach, we created an athlete reps group that we didn't previously have, an athlete wellbeing plan that looked at all the difficult areas around times when it's most difficult for the athletes, selection, deselection, um, and, and put an enormous amount of, around those areas to the point where now I can say that we're in a, much better place and a pretty good place and um, far from finished and and uh, there there are still some things that 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 aren't as I would quite like them but but we are hearing of them and dealing with them on a day, on a daily basis now which 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 is the best place we can be so let's talk about tokyo it's looming isn't it it's getting much much closer you have named some of your team already there might be further names to go in there liam heath has an opportunity to make history. Mallory Franklin, Kimberly Woods, Adam Burgess and Bradley Forbes Cryans. And some people might be surprised with the naming of Bradley because he's there ahead of Joe Clark. That just goes to show that it's very difficult to qualify in your sport for the Olympics because a reigning Olympic champion like Joe, you can only send the one the one paddler. Yeah, selection for slalom team was, was so incredibly tough and only one athlete per event, four disciplines, one athlete per event, and only one can go. And in each of those four disciplines, we had at least two and sometimes three athletes who who could have been on Olympic podium. So four athletes selected for the Games, all of them have pedigree, and uh, all of them with the potential to get on the, the podium in our, our slalom events. And we, we really hope that each and every one of them then does. In, in sprint, we're still qualifying athletes. Uh, Liam's qualified his, his quota place and his, his, his slot, his current Olympic champion, unbeaten actually since the Games in his K1 200 and, and in good shape going going into this season with, as I say, with some qualification events in May for the rest of the team. In Paracanoe, we've qualified seven places out of nine. Uh, we're pretty sure we'll qualify the remaining two in, in early summer and that team still has to be selected. But 
But again, when it is selected, I'm sure it'll be very strong. And you've got stated medal targets, three Olympic, three Paralympic. You've said you want to be a top three nation consistently. Topped the medal table when Para Canoe made a debut in Rio. And the trajectory at the Olympics, one medal in 92, then across the board in 96, it was a bit of a washout. And then games, each edition, subsequently you've Im- improved that medal total as well. So if anything, three doesn't sound as ambitious as maybe it should. <laughs> three's, three's a good number. And uh, the rest of the world's getting really strong. And uh, if we looked at the, the World Sprint Championships, for example, last year in, in Hungary, more than 100 nations, um, not not for the first time, but, but first time for a number of years, more than 100 nations competing and more nations winning medals than ever before. So so it was the big powerhouses in sprint of, of Hungary and Germany, but actually lots of nations now with really focused programs uh, creating some success. So so we're in a very competitive sport and, and we need to keep doing what we're doing really well, helping the athletes be the best they can be. Uh, and, and we're hopeful that we will come back with medals. Just a final one really on the Olympic programme. We talked there about slalom and sprint, but you mentioned freestyle earlier. Could you see the time in the same way that, you know, in ski and snowboard, we've got freestyle events now. In BMX, freestyle will be making a debut in Tokyo. With this IOC drive to be more youthful, more relevant, could something like freestyle canoeing come into the programme? I think never, never say never. And uh, at the moment, it looks as if the the picture looks fairly stable around sprint and slalom through through to Paris and potentially into LA. Uh, but canoe polo is a really interesting discipline as well, as a, as a team sport and and freestyle very visually attractive. And we are cognizant of direction of travel with IOC. So so there's no there's no real signs that that's where the ICF wants to go at the moment. The International Federation. But but we're working really hard to develop those disciplines and we can continue to do so. And is there potential as well for mixed gender kind of events as well, which again is something that the Olympics are are really keen on? It, it's coming quickly, isn't it, in other sports? And and it, it's been trialled in, in, uh, in, in, in some of the national championships and international events. So probably more probable than changes to... To the actual sports within within the games, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if we didn't see some mixed events in in Paris or or LA. So no Olympic white wharf, water rafting anytime soon. We're both a bit disappointed about that, aren't we? <laughs> I think we could all have a go at that. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Because you know who makes those decisions? Where does the lead come, if you like, for changing sport disciplines or or how does that come from the ICF or does that come from the IOC? I think it's a, a bit of a mix, and I'm not I'm not right in the middle of that space. So the the politics of how that actually works is 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 other people would be better better placed. I think the the ICF, our international body, has a responsibility to to keep looking to the future, and and so we're a we're a constant advocate within those international circles of looking what's right for our sport moving forward and ensuring that. That we start, we keep building something that that will capture imagination. So, I'd be disappointed if the ICF wasn't properly looking at the insight, analysing how successful other ventures have been in other sports, understanding what its member organisations are thinking, uh, and and then if it wishes to change program, having early conversation with IOC. We we know that IOC also wants to conti- continue to see modernisation. So, so I suspect it'll be somewhere between the two that we'll get this right in the future. Well, we wish you all the best of luck in Tokyo at both the Olympics and the Paralympics. David Joy, CEO of British Canoeing, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.